So thank you very much for coming, indeed. Uh, my name is Akira Tsuchiya of the World Economic Forum Japan. I'm heading this Japan uh, office in the Japanese community at the World Economic Forum. Um, today, we are going to have the special interactive session in workspace uh, style. And uh, I will not talk long anything on interactive things because we have a great professional moderator as well as the friends here. Let me just introduce uh, Ms. Yoshito Hori, who is the chairman of the Globis, who is uh, our joint partner for this particular session. He is a Global Agenda Council <laughs> member of uh, New Model for Leadership. As well, he is uh, uh, our partner of the Global Growth Company. So let me just call his hand, please. Good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you here today. This is a joint event with WF and G1 Summit. Let me tell a little bit about G1. Five years ago, young leaders met Professor Klaus Schwab at Dalian. We said that there's a China Summit and, and also India Summit. There's no Japan Summit. Why don't we create one? And he said to us that, why don't you create one? And therefore, we started G1. G1 stands for Group of One. It's not G20, it's G7, it's not G0. <laughs> 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 it's G1. <laughs> Group of One and Globe is One. It stands uh, G1. And then we started it, and then this time we, we did it in Japanese language, but last year we started G1 Global, which we talk in, in English. And today uh, we are happy to have this event, because in, as uh, Akira mentioned, I'm sitting on the Agenda Council called New Model of Leadership. There are 70 plus uh, Agenda Councils in WEF, but they all talk about leadership. So we, we like to talk about the leadership of Japan, and also the leadership of the, of the world, and what are the issues facing, and what are the leaders needed, and how we can act as leaders. And so today, we, we, I'm so happy to have Nick and Sir David and Hasegawa-san and Ian and Victor to be agreeing to be the panelists, as well as, you know, we like to have more participation from the audience, as well as we have the MBA students from Globus as well, so that we like to have new voice, voices from the younger people as well. So it's all yours, Nick, and then let's have great discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Well, each time I come here, there's an earthquake. Uh, yesterday. <laughs> so my job is on a Saturday morning to make sure that you have a, a spiritual and a content earthquake. Uh, I have to say, as some of you know, and Yoshi was there yesterday, we did a BBC World Debate as part of the IMF meeting. And uh, just when Schäuble and Christine Lagarde were really getting going, suddenly the whole place shook. <laughs> So I wondered what kind of verdict that was on the discussions we were having. It's being broadcast uh, this weekend. But I, I don't say that uh, facetiously because this issue of leadership, I'm a senior presenter for BBC World News. I'm here in a personal capacity. But this issue of leadership and the failings of leadership is really central to so many of the current challenges about the inability or the, the limits of leaders and leadership in, in, in situations which are so fast changing, whether you're here in this region, whether you're here in, whether you're in North Africa, or even in downtown London when you've got uh, protests going on. It's about how leaders cope, particularly uh, in this new digital environment, which is shortening the timelines for uh, pressure and also reaction. So that's the kind of background. My job is to make you all speak. Um, you have an advantage. You can see us clearly. We can't see you clearly because you're all in silhouette uh, with, the, with the wonderful skyline of Tokyo behind. But what I want you to see is this as a conversation. Um, it is, as you can see, there is a camera there, which means it's technically on the record. Uh, but uh, Yoshi says to me, if you want it off the record to be so frank, that you, you feel you don't want to be constrained by that, then it can be snipped out digitally, and it will be destroyed digitally, won't it? <laughs> we have 80 witnesses of that. Leadership will, will stand by that commitment. So we're going to talk for two hours. There's going to be a first session on Japan, a second session on the world. There's going to be no coffee break, um, and uh, you can go and get coffee over there if you need it. But do enter this spirit of conversation, because you've all given up your Saturday morning, and by 12 o'clock, we want some kind of uh, liftoff uh, with this issue, particularly, if I may say, from the next generation who are sitting at the back. Don't feel your heroes observers, because actually, leadership now is creating the conditions for you, which you're going to have to pick up uh, when you get into management positions uh, and move forward. So that's very much the spirit. 
uh, of uh, what we want to do. And I'm here, I suppose, to cause trouble, to make sure you all do remain focused uh, and you don't ramble on. Uh, and we do get somewhere, first of all, by 11 o'clock and then by 12 o'clock, when Yoshi can say it's been uh, a great morning. Thank you for coming, and we've achieved an enormous amount. Um, so let me introduce uh, uh, Sir David, first of all. Um, Sir David Wright, uh, who's a vice chairman of Barclays, which has no leadership problems. Um, and uh, but also former British ambassador here uh, in Tokyo. David, can you uh, give your assessment of the challenges, particularly in this region? Right. Um, so we have no problems about leadership <laughs> because we've just appointed a new set of leaders. And so I'm very comfortable with that. I Don't want to use the microphone, David. I want to. Um, so that was off the record, that. I. <laughs> I'm quite prepared to be on the record that we've appointed some new leaders. Um, I want to talk quickly on the basis of personal experiences in relation to Japan and in relation to leadership. Um, in politics, in our relations, in the UK's relations uh, with Japan, the greatest success story we have had uh, since the 1940s was in the persuasion of Japanese companies to see the benefits of investing in Europe and investing in the United Kingdom. That happened in the 1980s, was driven in the 1980s by the will of Margaret Thatcher at the time to get out to this country and to seek to persuade Japanese business leaders that they had an interest uh, in uh, investing their manufacturing plant in Europe and particularly in Britain, and the access that, that would give them to the European marketplace. That was a success in leadership for a politician, Margaret Thatcher, and for business leaders from Japan. So we ticked that one off as a success. We now have a failure of leadership in Japan. The failure of leadership in Japan is over the China question. We all can discuss the problems of the Senkaku, the problems of uh, the South China Sea. But we want to see leadership from Japan in approaching her friends around the world to get them to come up with a set of proposals for dealing with these South China Sea uh, issues, because it isn't just the Senkaku. It is also uh, Tokushima, Takushima. Uh, it is also the islands uh, off Vietnam. It's the islands off... Um, it's the islands of the Philippines uh, and the islands of Malaysia. Japan should be reaching out to her friends uh, in Europe, and I say particularly uh, to the United Kingdom, and showing some leadership in that respect, uh, which it is not showing at the moment. So I politically, I bracket the issue of investment and that as a successful case for leadership against the failure of leadership in respect to the South China Sea. Um, I come on now to a diplomatic question. One of the issues which Japan has failed on leadership in is related to the China question, and that is the apology for the events of the Second World War. That is a failure of leadership because it, is, it remains and has remained at the heart of Japan's difficulties uh, in this part of the world and with countries with which it has a friendly relationship. Um, Ten years ago, 15 years ago, I was involved in seeking to negotiate with the Japanese Gaima Show an apology to the United Kingdom for uh, the events of the Second World War and particularly for the treatment of prisoners of war. That was an initi initiative, a, 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 an example of leadership which we had to take, the United Kingdom had to take, in trying to persuade the Japanese Foreign Ministry uh, of the advantages uh, of seeing that. Of, of producing that apology. Uh, and we're still seeing the consequences of Japan's failure of leadership in that respect in terms of the attitudes which the Chinese are showing towards Japan over the South China Sea problems. Third area, Nick, uh, is business, the business I'm in at the moment, which is banking. We have seen a massive example of leadership in terms of our own bank when we took advantage of the collapse of Lehman Brothers in buying their business in the United States. That was great leadership, shown by a great leader, Bob Diamond, who is now sadly no longer with Barclays. It was a, it was, it, he, captured, he captured the moment. He 
He captured the opportunity of increasing the size uh, of our bank, giving us access to uh, a range of business uh, models which we had not had access to before, and expanding our overall um, position in, in global banking. At the same time, we negotiated an agreement here in Japan with the Sumitomo Mitsui Bank, a cooperative agreement which was of huge benefit to both Barclays uh, and to uh, Sumitomo Mitsui. It has, give, it, has given them, um, it has given them a capacity to expand their business internationally. It's given us a capacity to expand our business here in Japan. So I leave you, Nick, with three examples of successful uh, pursuit of leadership by politicians, by diplomats, and by business people. But I've also given you some cases where there has been failure. And we have to analyze and work back from those cases as to what that means about uh, how to take forward leadership in this country. Just before you before you sit down, David, what about the culture that you see, certainly having uh, worked here so, for so many years, but also the culture of, uh, w of that failing, and why, why is, it, is it something which is almost in the DNA here or not? <laughs> there is a problem in Japan over persuading Japanese leaders, political and business leaders, to take initiatives which may be risky and which may infringe and damage their relations with other interest groups in this country. I think that what we need to see in Japan, in terms of leadership, is a capacity to chance your arm a little. There isn't enough risk-taking in this country, and it is through risk-taking that some of the great benefits of leadership are found. Thank you very much, David. Yasushika uh, Hasekawa, the floor is yours. Not enough risk-taking, uh, so he... <laughs> So David has, uh, has said that very clearly, um, but what's your perception of, of the challenges here for leadership, whether it be regionally or certainly internally in the kind of areas that you are concerned with, with co uh, as a corporate executive? I'm gonna demonstrate my uh, not risk-taking, risk-averse risk attitude, because I'm not a diplomat, I'm not used to uh, speak in public or, or on the reco records, <laughs> so I'm gonna stick with my you know, memo I prepared. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, Sir David pointed out the many important and, uh, to some extent, painful uh, issues uh, from Japanese perspective, from outside viewpoint. So today, I'd like to uh, uh, put some of the uh, issues from my viepoint as an in insider of uh, Japanese in Japan. In the last three, four years, uh, Japan has been uh, searching for its new concept of leadership. Since the DPJ came pow became power uh, for the first extended period of time in the uh, modern history of uh, Japan, uh, we have been uh, making uh, our first step toward the true uh, two-party democracy, but uh, there is a lot of problems surfaced during the last uh, three years of uh, DPJ's uh, tenure. Um, so uh, the way I view this is uh, uh, maybe uh, we, we may still need uh, how long, I don't know, three, four years or more to have really a truly mature the democracy in this country where uh, people, regardless of the divided situation or whatever, uh, can uh, make a conscious decision on the high priority agenda for the country uh, with uh, consensus creation between the uh, leading party versus uh, opposition party. That should happen, uh, not, to, uh, be to, not to slow down the key decision making in Japan, but unfortunately it is not happening, so uh, it has to be uh, discussed and decided between the leading party and the opposition parties because uh, situation uh, become opposite, they're gonna face uh, the same situation anyway. And uh, they are uh, the responsible people and the parties to move Japan forward on any other key, agenda, uh, key uh, political issues without stalling and stalling uh, uh, making decisions. As a young blamer, uh, uh, we'll probably talk about, uh, in his own discussion, Japan is facing a new world today. As Ian puts it, a G0 world, and Japan has no time to lose. And the Japan, according to his uh, categorization, is uh, classified in the exposed country, one of those exposed country. Uh, we cannot pivot ourselves well to adjust to the new world reality. So our future is more difficult than the other countries uh, in the many other part of the world. 
Japan can no longer afford to be uh, caught in its uh, political and economic malaise. Uh, democratically, uh, to get our economic house in order, we need the reform of the social security system to be more sustainable in the face of a rapidly aging society. And we need to reform our tax base so that it prom uh, promotes uh, innovation and the risk taking at home uh, while also attracting investment from overseas. In the uh, 1960s and 70s, Japan was a rapidly expanding economy, and that growth was uh, turbocharged with a growing population as well. At that time, our political leaders was focused on the redistribution of wealth and the benefits in order to provide a greater opportunities throughout society and to ensure that all benefited, benefited from the nation's a new prosperity. When you look around Japan today, the great success of that policy is evident throughout the society, but the situation is now opposite. Politicians, instead of redistributing the benefit and the wealth, uh, uh, resourced from the uh, rapidly growing economy. Uh, now, politicians' role is to redistribute the burden and the pains to the society. That's the reality because of slow and sluggish and uh, uh, deflation station, uh, stage uh, lasting over the two decades. Let me see. And also, uh, I would like to point out new, new models for the readers in Japan. Uh, please allow me to change a little bit of direction. I am also acutely aware of the need for the Japanese leaders to become more extroverted, uh, more, more outward looking beyond the uh, borders of Japan, especially in the political arena, but also in the business and the academic arena. We need to be more uh, uh, outward lo looking uh, attitude because Japan, even though geographically uh, appears to be an isolated island, but the world is getting smaller and smaller. Everything happens uh, outside of Japan, the impact on Japan, uh, business and the political and the academic arena as well. So, uh, and also the, the Japan's uh, uh, return to the gross uh, uh, trajectory highly depends on the Jap strategies the Japanese government set up and the vis-a-vis the, the strategies being uh, uh, set and implemented by the neighborhood countries, uh, you name it, like uh, Korea or China or e even Singapore, they are doing all the policy setting uh, for their benefit in the future. So those are the key issues uh, we are uh, facing right now. And uh, Nick is uh, looking at me to be a, you know, a puncture in the, within the limited time, right? I guess so. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm going to stop this, and the uh, uh, rest of the issue, uh, I, uh, I'd like to uh, follow up uh, based on the, uh, answering the questions from the audience. My eyes always tell a story yeah, in a yeah, debate yeah. like this. <laughs> Thank you. But can you just pick up on Sir David's point about risk, yeah. that there's not enough risk-taking here? And that's, that's, that, that, that's, that, a, that's a point. Problem. But uh, as a, a businessman, I'd like to say... You know, uh, let me let me al uh, allude uh, my own ca company's case. Uh, we made uh, uh, 1.1 trillion yen acquisition last year. Uh, before we made that move, we have uh, intense internal discussion and a lot of questions and concerns expressed by our board members and the senior management team. Those are um, one, one of them was, you know, Mr. Hasegawa, you know, Mr. President, uh, we are going to make this acquisition attempt. But do we really know the risks involved in the emerging countries such as Russia, China, Brazil, and even in India? So I said, we don't know, but uh, the company we are targeting has a proven track record in the last couple of decades of building up the business on their own and very successful. And let me put it this way. You say the risk of the emerging countries, but do, you, do we really know how much risk we have in uh, having main operations in Japan. Japan is a high-risk country as well. And also on top of that, uh, world is rapidly changing, and we are sitting on 9 billion equivalent uh, cash on the balance sheet uh, with you know, a relatively um, thin pipeline situation. So if we put that all in our perspective, instead of sitting here without doing anything and something good will come, hopefully, why don't we t do something? And uh, you have to realize, taking risk in doing something may be better than not doing anything 
by taking bigger risk. That is uh, uh, the question I asked to see my senior management team. And finally, we all come together. Uh, Mr. Cowens, and then thank you very much indeed, David. Um, I just wanted to build upon what Hasegawa-san said and relate it to what I was saying. If you take my two cases of uh, Japan, uh, J Japanese leadership succeeding, notably outward investment to Europe in the 1980s, and my recent case of our relationship uh, with our partners, uh, with our partnership bank uh, here in Japan, these are cases where Japan has sought a partner. They are cases where Japan has seen the advantage of partnership, and they have been extremely successful. Indeed, Hasegawa-san was giving a similar case um, when he spoke of uh, a major acquisition for his company. A major acquisition is effectively a sort of partnership. Uh, what I'm saying, I think, about Japanese leadership globally uh, is that it ought to make better use of its potential partners around the world. It would be better if Japanese political leaders could look more widely at their potential partners because that, to some extent, the partnership mitigates the risk. And in addition, it gives a better global platform for Japan to expand its influence. David, thank you. Look, the ground rules here is that we can't see, uh, we can't see you terribly well. So if at the back you want to say something, could you put up a bit of paper or someone else can help? But what I'd like to do at the moment <coughs> is turn it on its head and say new generation coming up, the, the digital community out there and the impact that there is, because I'd like to hear uh, about the expectations now in the new digital environment out there, in Japan particularly, and the impact that that's having on the political class and the corporate class. James Kondo from Twitter, can you give us some idea of the metrics that you're seeing? Um, <laughs> I did warn you. Can you get a microphone, please? Um, because we need to understand how the whole matrix is being turned on its head, potentially, and how much the top realizes how fundamental the differences and the changes are below. James. Thank you, Nick. Um, um, I, I run uh, Twitter in East Asia. Um, and I, I just want to compare uh, three markets that I'm looking at, um, just to pinpoint um, where Japan stands. Uh, so um, a, a month ago, we were in um, uh, Dalian um, uh, in uh, China. Um, and where there is a Weibo, which has 500 million users. It's, it's not a Twitter service, but uh, a similar service. Um, and one of the things that, that I found quite interesting uh, was uh, when Jobel was speaking uh, at, the, at the platform. And, uh, and I got my friend's uh, sign of Weibo uh, to type in his name, uh, but it was blocked, so we couldn't type in his name. I mean, he was saying great things, I wanted to compliment it, but I couldn't type the compliment in. But we could type in the premiere uh, and get the message out. Um, but there's great sensitivity, obviously, about talking about political leadership. But that being said, uh, it's become very, very evident uh, that Weibo is having a huge impact uh, in terms of um, how people organize public demonstrations. Uh, and also, public de debate uh, on corruption and environmental degradation, which could you focus on Japan for okay. the moment, and I'll okay. come back Got to it. you okay. in, in the world uh, in the next session. Yeah. So for Japan, um, uh, one thing I will say is that this is uh, it's, it's a bit of a paradox for many people because it's one of the largest Twitter user base uh, in the world, and yet we're not seeing mass demonstration on the street despite lack of political leadership. So people have a lot of questions about that. Uh, and I'll just mention um, three things. Uh, first, um, I think people have um, not really uh, relied on the government. They've given up on the government a little bit. So what we saw during the earthquake was that uh, instead of requests for help of uh, rescues or food or shelter, um, people were actually asking other citizens for help. Uh, and tens of millions of citizens were basically asking for help and giving help simultaneously without the government intermediation. And because they knew that a lot of the government support was either not there uh, or couldn't be relied upon. Uh, and that was uh, real-time public uh, problem solving happening immediately on the ground, which was on the scale of, uh, we think, about 10 million users activating uh, in that issue identification, issue solution. So that was quite inspirational. We haven't seen uh, anything on that scale, I think, uh, around uh, the world. Uh, so that was a, a very uh, large phenomenon. Uh, secondly, in terms of political mobilization, we know that about 40% of people who participated in demonstrations around nuclear issues were mobilized through Twitter. Uh, and these were regular housewives and students who had never demonstrated before, uh, who uh, 
realized that this was something they wanted to participate in, whatever their view was. So um, when people say that people are not being mobilized, I think that's changing. Uh, and nuclear uh, accident was one of the first ones where we saw that. Uh, thirdly, in terms of politicians who are actively uh, using Twitter, uh, regardless of whether we agree with these policies or not, um, uh, Hashimoto uh, from Osaka uh, is probably the most um, visible user of Twitter. And I think what's different uh, about other countries and Twitter is that the polit political leaders have not really used uh, social media uh, in Japan very actively. And Hashimoto is the first person. And I think he's realized that what he needs to do is to set the agenda in a very provocative way, as opposed to reporting what's been debated and cleared through the PR office, which is what's happening with the government and a lot of politicians. So he's pointing a very provocative point of view and having a dialogue directly, not only with the public, but also having a very fierce debate with opponents at the same time. And he's having a very, very captivating uh, some would say a populist uh, impact on policy debate, uh, but I think we're seeing an emergence of that. Uh, but I think the one difference with some of the other countries is that the connection and I think uh, interest in engaging political leadership has been so disappointing that we're seeing uh, in Japan a lot more public-to-public -public social problem solving on Twitter as opposed to direct dialogue with the politicians, which is we see a little bit uh, right now in terms of mobilization and Hashimoto, uh, but I think a lot of the public has, has given up a little bit on that, and I think we'll have to see how that engages in the coming months. Given up on government, that's a very scathing uh, observation. It could be said in many other, other countries as well, but I wanted to hear that from James because it seems to me there's a danger of looking through the problems through the old prism, and the prism is changing amazingly fast, whether in Japan or elsewhere. So that's what I want to underpin this discussion for the next half hour before Ian and Victor take over and we talk about the world as well. Who else would like to come in? Did you want to... Yeah, please. Let's move it forward. It is a conversation. Interject as fast as you can because time will run out very quickly. Yes, I think one of the issues... Do you uh, want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, so Takashi Mitachi of Boston Consulting Group. Uh, uh, Hasegawa also mentioned about the risk-taking attitude. I think the true issue is actually lack of risk assessment and risk management. Proper continuous risk-taking should only uh, be able by assessing the right risk at the right time. When you look over to the nuclear issues, when you look back to the World War II, the leaders in Japan tend to close eye to the exact risk when the Asante is mounting and go on saying banzai, that we jump in to, uh, without uh, assessing the risk. So actually, natural tendency for us, and maybe I'm overgenerating it, is uh, ignoring the risk, particularly on the risk assessment side, but only by uh, really quantifying and understanding the risk, you can take risk. That's where we need to talk about the leadership on risk-taking attitude. Yeah, I, I agree, but no. Microphone, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, I just w wanted to uh, you know, uh, point out uh, uh, Mitesan's point. You know, uh, of course, uh, before we take an, uh, the risks, we have to make analysis, uh, which is true. But there is a certain point of uh, diminished point of return on investment on analysis. And Japanese tend to analyze more and more and uh, try to be 100%. We will never be 100% accurate. <laughs> so that's uh, you know, uh, 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 the line you have to draw. Otherwise, you'll, uh, you'll never be able to make the big decisions. But I totally agree with the business context, but going back to the political environment. That's the difference between business person and, and consultant. Yes. <laughs> and a politician. <laughs> I'm completely okay with that, LL. Would you like to say that again so we can hear your answer? <laughs> yes, I would like to stay a bit uh, beyond the uh, business versus consultant discussion. It's more of the political leadership discussion. I think uh, assessing the risks of Japan-China relationship. Uh, is this the right mechanism that for the corporate leaders, but the political leaders, really understanding the risks of doing that? Uh, that kind of uh, risk assessment system is lacking. Can but, I just but where the Japanese lack leadership in that particular respect is where I'm coming from, which is the partnership position. Japan is slow and not risky enough in seeking partnerships which will help it forward and help its own leadership forward. Could it be said, though, they're wiser for being not taking risk? No, uh, everything in this world is about risk. People who think that you can, people who think you can have a banking system without risk don't understand the nature of the business. You've got everything in this world involves risk. The problem we now have in the 21st century is that the risks 
are becoming more acute because of the problems we all face, whether they be political, whether they be business, or whether they be social. And it's therefore going to require all our societies to take more risk. Can I just check how many politicians are in the room? How many ministers or ex-ministers? Because I'd like you to respond to what we've just heard. So how many hands have gone up? I'm going to have to stand up. One here. Anywhere else? Anywhere else? But, but, but that, that, when we heard from James, they've given up on government. I mean, that's a very serious indictment of a political system. Former foreign minister. Is there anyone else? Literally one politician in the room. They've all gone. <laughs> that shows the extent of interest of, of politicians on many issues or the extent of business, of uh, how busy, the ex shows how busy we are. We just have to be, Saturday and Sundays, we have to be in the constituency, and I shouldn't be, <laughs> I shouldn't be here, really. Um, about um, people giving up on the government, I don't think that is true. I wish that they have given up on the government. If something happens, they always say, come back to the government or the politicians and say, that's your responsibility. Just about on every small, including the small issues that should be left to the either local governments or to the community or to, the, to their own home to be solved with. Everything is in the, in the I think we, in this country, we have a responsibility that government really takes care of your welfare. And that still is on the minds of the many, many Japanese. And that has not gone, unfortunately. We need to have a smaller government in terms of um, <coughs> expenditure. And we have to do away with many of the functions that the government plays at the moment. But what we're talking about here is effective government, which is clearly listening or gives the impression of listening to the concerns of those from the bottom up yes. who are now expressing these concerns. Yes. And I think we, we do listen to the, to the public. We uh, vote uh, with the public. We cannot do anything else but listen to the public. But the, the, the problem the, is that the... clear message the, here is, though, the perception is that, well, in the end, the political class no, is the, out of the, touch. The problem is that the views of the Japanese are so diverse and we try to reflect every citizen's thinking on or demand, but they are just so diversified, and we just cannot possibly take um, the, cannot make it to one view. I mean, if it's a single view that's expressed, we certainly will follow, but the views are divided. Right, let's get to a few more views. You've got the microphone, and then move it across your right. Thank you, Tatsuo Master from uh, Nagoya University of Business and Commerce, and I rather see this situation in Japan positive rather than negative because this is a test to where leadership could be very, very single-handed in politicians or there could be a multiple leaderships. And we, we, we are having the time of the rise of multiple leaderships elsewhere. Young people helping each other or companies who are working on their own foot, not relying on the government, or civil society seeking their own ways, seeking their own connection with the international communities, and all things are testing process where the Japan can get to, to the, the next, next phase of leadership. It's not a leadership of 19th century or 20th century. It should be not in the hands of single or civil political leaders. Rather, it should be multiple, and that could be adjust to multiple problems. That's my perception. So we are on the on the change on the positive side. Now. The microphone to your right. Okay. Is there a second microphone in here? Okay. Satoru Nishikawa. Who's got it? Okay. Uh, from the water, Japan Water Agency. The risk I see in Japan right now is the risk of underutilizing the resources that we have, especially the intellectual resources. And I say that because, uh, uh, Sir David, right, you mentioned about the risk of not utilizing the uh, international partners. And I see the same phenomena in Japan. There are a lot of, I'll say, professionals, academicians with intellectual knowledge, but their intellectual resources are not networked into the policy making right now. And that has been 
emerging in the last three years. And there is a lack of networking of professional profound knowledge. And I see that as a risk. And that leads to a very amateur policy decision making at the national policy. And that is the biggest risk that we face. And the politicians are now tending to look at uh, what the media shows, especially on the social media or on the TVs. And they are getting more and more short-sighted. And without uh, tapping on the intellectual resources that uh, we have here in Japan and also through the international networks, they are really not utilizing the intellectual knowledge that I see as a risk. Can I ask you, how much do you think that the political class is plugged in to the new reality that James Kondo has just outlined about what Twitter is now showing? Are they adequately plugged in? I have to say, I could be asking this question in virtually every country of the world. Yeah, I think they are only watching, I would say, I would say the surface of the Twitter and not tapping on to what the Twitter can draw out uh, from the other, I would say, intellectual resources. Yeah. And I see one of the, I'll say, uh, the, the uh, disadvantage of depending on Twitter is uh, the Twitter communication, the information is very limited. You can uh, post it on the Twitter. Yeah, but it makes an impact very it, quickly. Yes, it makes an impact, a very short uh, timing impact, but it doesn't go deep into the subject. But it doesn't stop politicians in many parts of the world using yeah, Twitter yeah. as a way of communicating, as well as, mm -hmm. I have to say, Facebook and other yeah. uh, platforms too. So we're just concentrating okay. on Twitter because there happens to be James here. Okay. But if anyone else from another platform would like to speak, please do. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that this was free seating, but we are at the moment focusing on people closer to the front. So please feel you can join in as well. But Glenn first, and then let's move across there and then come to you. I'd like to start with Glenn. You. A couple of comments. Uh, Glenn, Glenn Fukushima. Fukushima. I'd like to start with a couple of comments mm -hmm. about uh, Sir David's uh, initial presentation because although I agree with you that Margaret Thatcher was a leader, a political leader, the whole phenomenon of <coughs> Japanese companies investing in Britain and also investing in Europe within the, con was it within the context of the pressure on Japan because Japan's exporting so much. And as an alternative to exporting and, create, and, and creating unemployment abroad, the alternative was to invest in Europe and the United States. And so there was a whole context there of, of very intense political pressure in addition to leadership, which I admit is there. But I, I do think that the context is, is very, very important. So that's point number one. Point number two is I'm very curious when you said that you were discussing with the Japanese foreign ministry at that time some notion of an apology. And if you could perhaps tell us what, what was the sticking point? What, what was that, uh, the point that prevented you from making the breakthrough, which if you had succeeded at that point, perhaps we would have seen a much better relationship well, right. between uh, the, the US, uh, between Japan and, and its neighboring country and Asia. Thirdly, on the point of risk, if I could just say that in addition to the notion of uh, difficulty of, of assessing risk, I think the whole problem in Japan is that there is no tolerance for risk. If you make, if you make a mistake, you are very, it's very difficult to recoup your losses. The whole society is structured in a way that penalizes risk. It penalizes making mistakes. And if you, so it's often said, it's a cliche, in Silicon Valley, investors will invest in people who have tried and failed than people who have not tried. <coughs> because the notion is that you've learned something from failure. But the it is very fundamentally a major problem in Japan that it, it is so structured as to not allow people who have made mistakes to recoup their losses. So you will never, if you, pen if you penalize mistakes so much, I think it's extremely difficult to get people to take risks. And another point was about the decline in the dependence uh, on trust in government. I think that's very true. At the same time, as Ms. Koch said, uh, there's a, there is a deep-seated seated reliance on the Japanese government, not so much politicians, perhaps, but on, on the bureaucrats. There has been until recently, I think, but the events uh, over the last few years, in particular the regime change of 2009 and the disappointment as a result of that has, I think, dramatically decreased the, the, uh, the hope in, in politicians. And the March 11th uh, nuclear disaster uh, has also seriously, according to many public opinion polls, including the Edelman Global Survey of uh, Trust, uh, has really seriously damaged the trust 
uh, of the public in, in the government. And then finally, on IT, it's absolutely true. It's not only in politicians and in the government and in the business sector and academia. I think Japan is so far behind in the use of IT generally, including in particular social media. I was in a meeting just two days ago where Mr. Nishida, the chairman of Toshiba, said that he felt that one of the major reasons that Japan has fallen behind in its competitiveness has to do not only with globalization, but with the inadequate use of IT. And I think it's absolutely true. Thank you very much. David, before I just come to you, if you could just clarify on that particular point, give us a two-minute version of history rather than a 20-minute version of, of how difficult it was. But can I just point out, uh, I was at the World Knowledge Forum in Seoul three days, four days ago, and you were there as well, Yoshi, and we heard the president of the World Bank, the new president of the World Bank, talk about how he wants to look at failure as a way of learning for the future, and he wants to have within the World Bank fail fairs, as he calls them, where no one's going to be blamed, but we've got to learn from where we went wrong, changing the culture within the World Bank. I was very struck by that um, and the way he expressed it. David, a quick answer on that, just one, that, that two, one point, please. Two answers, Glenn, to your question. First of all, Nissan Motor Company took a risk in 1982 by agreeing to invest in a motor car manufacturing plant in the UK. You are correct. This was to some extent because of the pressure on Japanese uh, 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 exports, which were growing exponentially. Ishihara-san was facing a real problem with the leader of the auto workers union, Shioji, uh, in Nissan at that stage. Ishihara-san was keen to invest, but he had to take the risk of taking on Shioji-san uh, in order to get that through the company and to be able to pursue that investment, which opened up the whole door for Japanese investment in the whole of Europe. So that was a risk-taking proposition in terms of a partnership which worked to the advantage of Japan. On the question of the apology uh, for the Second World War, I will, I, I'll transfer that to the risk which was taken by France and Germany in Europe after the Second World War, when Germany was very prepared to take that major risk in apologizing for causing the Holocaust. And we saw yesterday that to some extent the benefit of that risk was, a, was, a, was awarded to, to Germany and her partners in Europe through the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, which was announced yesterday to the EU. So that was another risk. And I think if Japan had been prepared earlier to take a risk over the apology question for the Second World War, the relationship that she has with China now could well have been very different. Please do. Please, please, please do. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, David, you talk about apologies. Now, total surrender, unconditional surrender, goes much beyond all the apologies that here and there. And the word apology became very prevalent after the comfort women issue and so on. Yes. But I think total unconditional surrender goes beyond apologies. No apologies or anything. So I'm, I just wondered whether you were putting these things together. Well, uh, um, I, I'm very conscious this is very tender ground and very, <laughs> a, very, a very difficult subject. And I, I can tell you that the word shazai, which was the sticking point in the negotiations we were having uh, in, in uh, 1995. Um, but the, the fact is, that the Chinese are now reverting back to that history in their, uh, in their analysis of the problems over uh, Senkaku. So just one, one minute's version of uh, risk-taking. You know, that Glenn, you mentioned that, that a low tolerance on the, the risk-taking or failure in Japan, but in my view, uh, leaders in Japan, particularly in the business world, is using that as an excuse not to take risks. And the flip side of the coin is because Japanese investment communities and the shareholders are so much tolerant to the complacency of the executives. That is another problem. So, you know, that, that's both sides of the equation that we have to, you know, improve. Otherwise, uh, this attitude is not going to change. Let me encourage the leaders of the future to come in as well. You're sitting at the back wondering what all these people at the front are talking about. So um, let, let me encourage you to, to, to highlight, in the same way that I went to James, about the new realities which have to be faced. Uh, and let me just underline that, of course, Nissan is now going to be producing its electric cars in Sunderland. So the investment is, is, uh, is increasing. Please. We have also investment in... Uh, I know you <laughs> I know you <laughs> What do you want to t tell us about your investments in Britain? 
you on the record. Uh, yes, Bacall, JP Morgan. Um, I think it's absolute nonsense to say that Japan doesn't take risk. Japan takes huge risks, uh, but Japan is very bad, and in fact, it's culturally inbred to not celebrate that risk taking and celebrate that success. Uh, one of the most successful global corporations is Japan Tobacco, led by a bunch of bureaucrats, but it's arguably one of the most successful and most, uh, from a governance structure and from a profitability structure, most integrated uh, global corporation. You talk about finance. Um, your colleagues from Nomura took the same risk. Now, it didn't work out, and there may have been issues in implementation, that structure, but it's nonsense to say that they don't take risk. Our friends in finance from, what is that great bank, Robbie? Uh, Mitsubishi Bank uh, took a, what is it, 20, 25% stake in a failed at the time, or close to failed, major American investment bank, and that thing is working gangbusters. It's leading all the Japan investment banking tables right now, superbly successful. Now, the chairman of that bank or the president of that bank may not be walking away with a gazillion dollar bonus, and he may not be on the front page of Fortune magazine, but from an operational perspective, huge risk-taking successfully implemented. Another point, the bureaucracy. Japan had a big debt deflation financial crisis. Japan, as many other countries now have had as well. Yet Japan is the only place that took the risk of changing the regulatory structure. The almighty Okura Sho was disemboweled, gave up its banking and security supervision, METI lost its regulation of the commodities trading site, and they set up a new thing called the Financial Services Agency that actually now is the only place in the world where we have had true systemic regulatory change. This is huge risk taking, and it was implemented and, uh, you know, the Japanese deserve much, much credit for doing something that neither Europe nor the United States have actually been doing. Finally, the point of politicians listening or not listening to the new expression of grassroots democracy that we get through new technologies. The fact that you do have a government that is prepared to announce the possibility of going zero nuclear, right? is clearly based on listening to some of the grassroots movements that have been going on. And again, the government here is taking a huge risk. And unlike, I'm from Germany, Angela Merkel, who stands in the limelight and says, we're going ex nuke, and I get all the credit for that, here in, in Germany, they haven't switched off a single nuclear reactor since then, while in Japan, you know, we still basically run no nukes. So just Japan deserves a little bit more credit. And the nature of the game is, that Japan is bad, is inbred, Japan does not celebrate success. The nail that sticks out gets hammered in. But you are saying that bureaucrats can make great leaders. Bureaucrats make fantastic leaders. <laughs> Who'd like to admit to being a bureaucrat in the room? Why did you ask whether any bureaucrats are in the room? <coughs> I have just asked. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I haven't seen the hands go up yet. Um, oh, yes, I have, yes. Yeah, well, just I follow it up. I'm Nobuo Taraka. I'm the ex-executive director of the IA and ex-bureaucrat. <laughs> um, yes, you're right. Just uh, this malfunction on um, the issue after ma March 11 is a total loss of confidence of public to the government or governance mechanism. And the role of bureaucrat is definitely in the deep trouble now because the politics is not res listening to what the bureaucrats say. Yes, it's a big failure of METI about these nuclear risks. And it's a big failure of METI, again, of trying to stop zero nuclear option. It's simply impossible, simply impractical. And METI does know it, but didn't say directly to the ministers and prime minister. Same thing about Senkaku. The nationalization of Senkaku is a huge risk. But Ministry of uh, Ministry Foreign Affairs didn't make clear statement to stop that kind of stupidity. This is a responsibility of Ministry of Finance, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Finance did great success, yes, of tax reform, but monopolizing the ear of Prime Minister, they risked, <laughs> they risked the diplomatic failure and energy security failure. So this is a kind of malfunction in the governance mechanism of bureaucracy in Japan. And this restructuring or 
power change or some way of governance mechanism streamlining is what Japan should do now. Thank you. Miyagawa-san, can, can I ask you, do you, from the foreign ministry perspective, <laughs> do you want to say anything, particularly to that last point, but also this great vote for, for bureaucrats? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm very glad. I remind you, you're on the record, in case you weren't here at the beginning. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for a very uh, immense admiration for the risk-taking uh, attitudes of the private sector of Japan. And we are very glad that he also mentioned uh, the risk-taking attitudes of the Ministry of Finance and METI. So, and so therefore, a finger is now pointed at uh, the risk aversion attitude of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, if I speak about... I'm giving the, you the right of reply here. Okay, yes, yes, of course. But I speak about... The, you see, the whole, the present Ministry of Foreign Policy, uh, uh, the, I do have to ask uh, uh, off the record. But uh, let me comment. Let, let me, let, should we be clear? Is this off the record now? Uh, it's okay. Okay. But if, uh, let me speak on the, uh, the risk aversion uh, foreign policy in the history, uh, which, on which I am now studying. This is, uh, as you see, we have two uh, uh, English gentlemen. I should like to uh, you see, raise one point on the Anglo-Japanese alliance uh, history. Uh, Anglo-Japanese alliance was made on 20, uh, 1902. Uh, interestingly, in 1907, uh, Britain proposed to expand this alliance to cover India, uh, to protect India from the incursion from uh, Russia. Uh, it was a very good proposal, but Japan hesitated. And due to this hesitation, there was very uh, these strong arguments inside Japan. And due to this hesitation, Britain was very much disappointed. Uh, if Japan had accepted the expansion proposal by Britain, then perhaps, uh, this, is not, this is my uh, study subject, perhaps there could not have been an end to the alliance in 20, uh, 1921. And even more importantly, there couldn't have been a Pacific War. Uh, Risk-taking, perhaps, uh, uh, attitudes is now very seriously being studied by inside the Japanese foreign policy. Thank, Thank you. you. David, do you want to come back after what we heard about the great defense of bureaucrats? Uh, well, as an ex-bureaucrat, I'm delighted to hear it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I wanted to thank Jesper Kroll, um, whose work I've b admired for many years uh, for his, his contribution, um, and uh, to agree with him entirely that the problem is there is perhaps not enough celebration of risk in this country. More celebration of risk in Japan would actually enhance the capacity of the country to accommodate that risk and accommodate the possibility uh, of failure. So I'm 100% with you. And indeed, the example you gave uh, about Mitsubishi Bank is another example of my, my basic position, which is that cooperation by Japan with other international partners uh, is, a f is a way in which risk can be both mitigated uh, and in which Japan can show more li global leadership, which is, uh, as, as I w said to the Gaima show, what I've always wanted to see Japan do internationally, uh, more global leadership and doing that glo having that global leadership in cooperation with other states. It's happening in the private sector. It needs to happen more internationally. Well, we'll move on to that in a few minutes when we talk about the world. Now, who's got the microphone next, please? Yes, uh, my name is Yota Keuchi. I currently uh, I belong to the Disaster Bank of Japan, or Development Bank of Japan, and former <laughs> a notorious Minister of Finance, bureaucrat, and uh, I also belong to the baby boomer generation, most powerful generation in the world. Now, I, have, I would like to say only two things. Discussion today related to leadership. I could say that we are talking about a leadership-less society. And the secondary, we are talking about uh, no risk-taking society. It, what the conclusion come from these two is simple. It's a good for the time for the young generation. If there is a no leadership society, you have uh, future leaders. In terms of risk-taking, actually we are taking risk for the, just Esper said that, we are taking risk of the very far end of the future. The risk of, you are talking, thinking about the risk of 2030 or 2050. That's a tremendous risk, burdened by the those young generation. As a baby boomer generation, we have already transferred the risk to that area of the young generation. So it's 
we don't take risk tomorrow risk, but uh, actually we transfer risk from t this time to the future. So you as a young generation have a big burden to bring the leadership back to the today or tomorrow and uh, how to avoid the risk of, of the future. I'm waiting for the leaders of the future who fear there's no leadership because to come those in. Are, yeah, those are so silent let, leaders, let, that's a problem. Well, let me hear a, a voice from a, uh, the, the next generation listening to this discussion. My name is Hasenga, a Grobe student. Thank you for welcoming, Horisan. And uh, from my opinion, the next generation, the leader will come from the, 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 in the, tw the early uh, 20s or the teenagers nowadays. Because we are in the 30s and we are failing that. And from the next generation, 20s and 30s and 40s, they are succeeding the business in Japan and overseas. They are moving to the foreign countries and they are doing the business now. And I think uh, now in the 60s and 70s, they have the pension and the money and the wealth. They will finish up the money within 20 years. So that, that pain, the loss of the money, loss of the wealth of Japan, will start to change the Japanese, uh, Japanese country itself. So that in that time, they are coming back who are living in foreign countries. And uh, the Japanese reformation will start. But we don't expect that no nowadays the politicians to do that. Because they are listening so much what the uh, nation to say, but uh, they are not reading, they are not widening they are what they are thinking to are their you, nation. You're, you're pointing to the teenagers and the 20-year-olds the uh, yeah. as the leaders of the future. D does that mean that someone like you already fears you're becoming systematized here? Yes. <laughs> you that, you that, said yes. Yes, I, I have such uh, tremendous, uh, how can I say, the problem. So that it is very difficult, but uh, uh, we are trying to change, and uh, that young, younger generation, which had uh, no success story, they are doing their business All right. already, All so right. that they can do that. Yoshi, you've got some syllabus challenges here, I think. <laughs> so you might want to come back on that, please. I'll come to you. My name is Kaji, and working for the Prime Minister's office uh, as a bureaucrat, uh, with 25 years of experience in uh, private sector. I'd like to compare the incentive systems of the bureaucrats and the business person. If you take a look at that the business person's incentive, that is pretty much result driven for sure. So you have to monitor year by year by the financial situation. On the other hand, the bureaucrats has been monitored their performance by the more process because they are going to move <coughs> their uh, uh, responsibilities within a two years. But they took the four years of the, the uh, length for the, their uh, uh, true performances. That means that the one bureaucrat doesn't do the uh, initial stage to the final stage. That's uh, naturally uh, they are leaning toward the more uh, process drip instead of result drip. So the leader must transform the incentive system. Otherwise, even though the people who are very talented as a bureaucrat are not well performed. So I think the leader should perform, uh, leader, sh leader should transform the incentive system itself. Let's move the microphone forward, please. Hi, my name is Yoko Ishikura. I'm a professor at the Graduate School of Media Design, Keio University. Uh, I, as I hear about the discussion on risk and leadership and so forth, it seems like that we're talking about risk and sort of vacuum. And I think that the risk is something that the individuals take. And we should never forget because that is what it is, even though the society may be more favorable for risk taking or not. Because the, the risk is related to decision making. Decision making leads to responsibility of the consequences of your, uh, of your decision. And I think it's, uh, it's much more individual risk taking is, uh, is encouraged because the, uh, the IT and Twitter and all that is an enabler of the individual expression and individual decision making. And at the same time, I have interacted with like high school students and teenagers and so forth, and they are very much afraid of doing something new. And that is perceived as risk taking. And I think one of the reasons is because they really don't have anybody around them who have taken risk, who have done something very different. And uh, if you have quite a few people around you who have taken risks, or meaning that they have made rather unusual decisions, 
and uh, take the, the new job or whatever, or go abroad and so forth. But they haven't died or anything, or they haven't kill, been killed or anything like that. And then you have a little more encouragement or support of doing something a little bit different. So I'm very much uh, uh, encouraged by the, uh, the, uh, the motivation and the enabling uh, element of the IT and Twitter for the individual risk taking in Japan. And I think that's going to change the, the society very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to take a risk now. We're almost out of time. But as we're all in the same room and there's going to be a, a kind of a, a very quick turnover here, I think we're helping set the, the scene for the world discussion as well. So I'd like to just keep going. There are a lot of people who want to contribute at the moment. Uh, and Ian uh, and Victor, if you could just be patient for a moment, because I think this will help inform our discussion for the next hour as well. Let me. So can I ask you to keep brief, to contribute, and then we'll keep moving forward, please. Sure. Um, Nicholas Smith from uh, CSA. On the, on the point of um, leadership, you've got to remember that uh, support ratios for Japanese politicians start at the beginning at about 65 to 70% and drop to 30% within the first uh, three months. So people have immense faith in these people, and that's dashed by incompetence within months. So they're, they're quickly weighed in the balance and found wanting. On the, on the idea about uh, risk-taking, um, we use a lot in Japanese the expression genten tsuki. In other words, there are minus points for, um, for making a mistake, but no uh, reward for getting it right. The suggestion, I think almost invariably, uh, cultural um, explanations are, are wrong. And I would suggest that um, an easier thing is uh, zero interest rate policy. So if the, um, the opportunity cost of capital is, is zero, then you don't have to take risks. You've got to understand Japanese uh, banks. There is almost no cash flow based uh, lending going on in Japan, almost uh, without uh, exception, uh, you borrow up to 70% uh, of uh, tangible risk, uh, uh, tangible big benefits. Thank you. Move the mic forward, uh, James. Uh, Doug Get Peterson down, sorry. from sorry. Standard & Poor's, yeah. and I will be very brief. I was recently at a conference where I was with policymakers, and somebody said, if we had seen the financial crisis staring us in the face of the mortgage boom, we should have done something about it. And I said, well, we are staring at a demographic challenge around the globe, social protection systems everywhere. And the leadership on changing of social security systems and healthcare systems has come from Sweden, from Singapore, from Chile. They're models which people are, are addressing. Mm. And Hasegawa-san raised the point about the social security and the retirement and healthcare systems. I think there should be a Japan solution. Japan should take leadership in this area. Japan faces the most daunting demographic challenge of almost any country in the world. And, and I think that it's also a bridge topic for these guys. Hasegawa-san and uh, Sir David, just pick up on these points, can you, just before I hand over to Ian and Victor in a moment, just a couple more contributions. Um, Sage Kondo, the uh, commissioner of the Agency for Cultural Affairs. Um, having spent 40 years as a bureaucrat, being sandwiched by the politicians and the public, I feel that, uh, well, I, I think the uh, most uh, 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 important issue is not the lack of leadership on the part of politicians, but lack of patience and ability on the part of the public to nurture and develop good leaders. The mm. public is becoming more and more impatient, uh, influenced by short-termism, and uh, breeding populism. Um, the public is not patient enough to wait for leaders to develop themselves, uh, partly because of the uh, quick change of uh, prime ministers in the last uh, several years. Uh, it, we, can't see, uh, we, are, we don't see many good experienced, well experienced politicians. So it's time for us to be more patient, waiting for three, four, five years for leaders to develop themselves because of the short term and because of the uh, tendency of the media to find excuses to draw legs of the prime ministers on the day of the election. So this will not, this is not productive at all. So media and public should be more patient and trying to, to help to, to, to become a good follower. This is one of the issues we are facing. The idea of the media becoming more patient, are you saying that uh, we should delay our question for two or three days. <laughs> Why not? I That's mean, not what I'm paid to do. It used to be that uh, all the prime ministers and presidents were given honeymoon period of 100 days. Mm. That's not the case anymore. Now you get 10 days for a honeymoon. <laughs> one day. Well, one day maybe, yeah. 
Yoshi, do you want to come in? Because um, there have been a number of uh, very blunt assessments of the leadership capabilities here. I have to say what I've heard there, I hear in other countries as well, so I don't think it's unique to Japan. But particularly the voice from the back, which suggests that maybe um, you're going to have to change your syllabus a little bit or okay. modify it. <laughs> well, <laughs> let me point two things uh, quickly. One is that I tend to believe that there's old Japan and new Japan. It's not age, it's more mentality. How it do you define old, new and old? Old is a uh, uh, risk averse and not dynamic, too much domestic focus. New Japan is more global and entrepreneurship and use, using IT and risk taking. And when I look from New Japan perspectives, lots of people are taking risk. But if you look from this angle, you know, lots of people are risk averse. So I think, it's not, I think it's not so fruitful to be discussing about risk, taking risk averse. But one more thing that I want to talk about is that looking from the history of Japan, history perspective, Japan always goes from like a, a radical transformation, revolution type of period, and they're stable for the past like for the 20 or 30 or 100 years, and the radical transformation, and they're stable. In the time of stable uh, uh, society, you know, there is a saying that the nail that stick out tend to be bashed. But in, the, in times of radical transformation, you gotta, you gotta stand up, you gotta speak up, you gotta uh, be a great leader. This is a great timing for us to be standing out and say something and using Twitter and Facebook and change the environments. And we tend to believe this is a timing for the young generation or new Japan to be standing out and changing. And so I love this you know, like, uh, uh, the chaos and uh, lots of troubles. It's going to be a great time for entrepreneurs to be uh, taking ch uh, charges. Hasegawa-san, your view, having heard this debate and where, how far it's moved on the issue. I'm still optimistic about the future of this country yeah, because uh, uh, in my age, as, a, as a, I'm a part of the, uh, the baby boomers, but everybody was uh, uh, rushing into the, uh, uh, the business and also believed that tomorrow is uh, richer than uh, today. But situation has changed, so uh, the people's attitudes are uh, divided in young people as well, in my view. But at least 20 to 30 percent of the, the young generation are more ambitious and more risk taking and more broader minded than my age. That is my overall perspective. That's why I'm optimis optimistic about the future of the country. And secondly, uh, I kind of support that the people are giving up the, the pol pol police politicians because if you look at the uh, you know, voting rate or against the total po voters population, it's declining over time regardless of the national election or local election. And uh, to mitigate that kind of uh, uh, giving up attitude trend, politicians can improve that by implementing just electronic voting system, which is already implemented in the neighborhood countries. I don't say <coughs> specific country's name, but, but it's a simple ch a change of the law. And you can dramatically. And another problem is in, in, in older generation, the voting rate is much higher than the younger population. So younger people who are supposed to carry over this uh, country's future is giving up because of a ha extremely low voting rate. That means uh, current politicians are not supported by the future of this country, the young generation. That is a problem, in my view. Hasegawa-san, thank you. Uh, so, David, uh, you've just heard a bit of counter-battery fire from uh, a few people here. Uh, what's your feeling uh, about the Japan you see, not least after this last hour of discussion? Uh, like Hasegawa-san, I remain hugely optimistic about this country and uh, hugely optimistic, as I've tried to emphasize in what I've said, about the capacity of Japan to cooperate internationally and through that cooperation to be able to push forward uh, its own economy and push forward its own uh, position diplomatically and politically uh, in, the, in, in the global environment. Um, I don't think we should get too wrapped up uh, with the social media issue. Um, it's a bit, it's, if I might say so, it's rather voguish uh, to be uh, wrapped up with that. What we need uh, in all our countries, and this is true of European countries as much as uh, of Japan, uh, is to see uh, politicians prepared to confront some of the issues which they are going to face. And what Doug Peterson said, I think, was frightfully important in terms of future social welfare um, uh, arrangements. Um, we need to see po have politicians we need politicians uh, to take those sort of risks in confronting these problems. But internationally, Japan should seek out its friends politically, diplomatic, diplomatically, and in business, because there are plenty of them out there. 
Well, um, let uh, me thank Hasek Abbasan and Sir David. Thank you very much indeed for your thoughts. <laughs> and ask if you can do a hot switch.